We are, wow, I didn't realize Dylan could get on before I hit the go live button. That's impressive. Okay. All right, well, we are live. All right. Um, so whoever is uh, new to this channel, uh, my name is Zach Watson. I'm a, I used to be a math teacher, and I'm now a multimedia teacher, and um, I work at a school in Massachusetts. Uh, my colleague here is Renato, uh, teaches history. I find him to be one of the, the quieter ones that always has the, the jokes and like the those quick little comments that if you don't catch it, you're kind of sad you missed it because um, he doesn't repeat himself all, all that much. But um, I wanted to ask him a couple questions here today. I wanted to provide a little bit of insight to my students as to how awesome this guy is. Um, and did you get a chance to review some of those questions I sent you? I did. I, I got the text you sent me and I was able to... Uh, Read a few of them. So awesome. I don't know if you want to do it. You want to just roll through them, or yeah. And uh, uh, whoever's in the chat, feel free to go ahead and add to them. Um, Renato, I don't know if you have any time constraint. At my my afternoon's open, so let me know if if you got to go. No, I think I'm all done with my conference calls and everything for the day. So that's good. Awesome. All right. So my first question is: uh, Was this your first career as a teacher? Uh, no, um, I. I'd always wanted to be a teacher. It was uh, always uh, an interest of mine ever since I was a little kid. But you know, life doesn't always turn out the way you think it will. Uh, before this, I was actually um, in the corporate world. I was in marketing uh, for a medical equipment manufacturing uh, company. Um, but they um, they switched. They were located in Andover, uh, Massachusetts, and then. Um, you know, to save money or through like a tax break or whatever it was, they um, sent everything, uh, they moved everything down to uh, Nashville. And I could either move with them, you know, relocate down to Nashville, or I could uh, do a career change. And like I said, since I always wanted to be a teacher, I figured, you know, why not give this a shot? So that's, that's how I ended up here. So if you wanted to become a teacher, but then, you know, life brings you in different directions, how did it end up going in that direction in the first place? Uh, well, like I said, I always wanted to be a teacher. You know what I mean? Uh, so I tried at the beginning, but then I had a um, – it's, it's such a long, boring story. But uh, while I was in school, I was in um, – I was at college, and I had a part-time job at a hotel. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, things went very well there, and they offered me um, – a uh, assistant manager job so it was making more money you know so i'm like, all right fine so i took that and from there i met a contact uh who uh wanted me to try out a job at um in marketing you know so and that paid even more so i'm like all right so i'll try that yeah you know? and um the teaching thing just kind of fell by the wayside and i ended up being in marketing for almost uh, 14 years you know and wow. uh yeah, no, um, I think it was John Lennon who said, uh, life is what happens when you're busy making other plans, and that's exactly what happened. Yeah? That's so true. Yeah. I asked that because I, I feel like I had a, a slightly similar experience where I knew I wanted to be a teacher. My teacher was a, my mom was a teacher for 36 years. Oh, really? Um, I went into college for engineering, and then I figured I'd probably end up in engineering, but I knew teaching was somewhere along the way. Mm -hmm. And I think you just kind of follow wherever the money brings you. And everyone's like, yeah. oh, you have all these college loans. You got to pay those off first. And Absolutely. very true. And then I, I took like a half. I was at $66,000 second year out of college. And then they cut my salary in half to become a teacher. Wow. Um, tough. Uh, my next question. What did you learn before teaching that you didn't realize would help you as a teacher? So like, what did you learn in marketing or in the business you were in that maybe you didn't know would have translated over? I don't know if I'd say I didn't know it would translate. It was, um, I just didn't know it would translate as much as it did. Um, in marketing, you're always presenting and pitching and working in teams and with groups and everything. And I mean, I can't think of a better skill, you know, to uh, bring over to the teaching world. Um, so I was, I was very used to working, you know, um, when we would launch marketing campaigns and things like that, uh, we would always be in teams. And if I was the one running the campaign, I'd be like, you know, kind of the teacher of the group, 
you know, and I would, yeah. you know, share my ideas and uh, I'd get input from everyone else, you know. Um, so it was, it was in, in that respect, it was a seamless transition, you know, just bringing those skills over to teaching. You know, I was very used to, to doing that. Um, yeah, I feel like a lot of students are <laughs> hate presenting and probably would not br probably are not getting the uh, the reps and the opportunity to do that, or they're not taking the opportunities a lot of time. Yeah, no, uh, I'm not. It's much easier. I don't know if that's the right word. I, I'm much more comfortable doing it with uh, my students than I am with like you know colleagues and people yeah. like my age and you know right. people. That I would like report to, or you know, authority figures, or anything like that. You know, um, yeah. when when we're all kind of in the same group and we're all just kind of doing the same thing, it's much easier. You know, you feel like a sense of, you know, community or family or whatever. Whereas if you're talking to your boss or your boss's boss or whoever, you know, um, it's intimidating. So I, I I totally get if like a student is intimidated to you know present in front of the class or do anything like that because I'm, I'm in the same boat. It's just, I'm more comfortable with them than they are with me apparently. Um, a question from the comments. Uh, so Dylan is on and he says, what have you been doing during this time for both of you? Nothing. Oh, what have I been doing or how have I been doing? <laughs> what have you been doing? I've been nothing. I've just been watching Netflix and this, this is the, the first piece of work I've done at all. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I, I have been more busy now than all of the months before this at school combined. You know, we're launching remote learning and we're getting in, enrichment pages up on, um, on the web. And uh, we have all these conference calls. And we got to keep track of all the stuff that we're doing, you know, and reaching out to the families. So it's just a ton, ton of work. Uh, I think once we kind of, you know, get this machine rolling, um, It'll get easier, you know. It'll we'll, we'll all develop like a um, routine, if you will. Um, but you know, it's just important to keep all of this in in perspective, though. You know, it's it's a scary time out there, and there's a lot of stuff going on in the world. I mean, the the entire world is affected by this, you know. So, um, I, I'm actually very glad and happy that I'm as busy as I am, you know, and not forced to just sit on the couch and watch the news all day I'd lose my mind <laughs> yeah yeah that was kind of me so I was out a week before the school closure I feel like that was a little bit of me uh because there was a substitute in for me I didn't really have to create like stuff to send in so mm -hmm. I was watching news probably two to three hours a day it was disgusting yeah I don't, I don't even have tv I just have an apple tv um <laughs> Uh, and would you say that the majority of it is communicating with people like, or is it creating stuff? In the beginning it was communicating, but now that all the, you know, directives have been rolled out, you know, we've all received our marching orders. So now I'm spending a ton of time creating content and lesson plans and things like that. So yeah. it's pretty well split down the middle now for me anyway. How about you? Um, for me, I think I have, so I know that I have, uh, you guys have a huge disadvantage because you guys are all advisees. So mm -hmm. you have to contact all the students and the parents. Uh, I don't have to do that. Um, so I've been trying to look for ways how, like Brian uh, did that 36 minute long video and I was, I wanted to help him out with that. Um, I want to find ways to help you guys take some of the workload off or the attention off of you guys or something. Um, I was like last week when they did that workout video thing, I was so glad to have a project to do. Uh, <laughs> that I was something that I thought I was actually good at, which is video editing. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm surprised at how well my drawing video has been <laughs> received. Everybody yeah. seems to be doing baby Yoda drawings and all that. <laughs> Except for Christian. Christian doesn't seem to like baby oh, yeah, Yoda. Like not baby a fan. Yeah, not a fan. Did, uh, did you see the other thing I sent you with the drawing yesterday? What, what thing was that? So I was looking, I was bored and listening uh, to like the top TED Talks in the world and like the number five or something was oh, something yeah, I did. That you think you can draw. So I ended up drawing um, these, which 
I thought was not bad. I honestly didn't think I could draw, it, and then I feel like I came out with these not not so horrible cartoons. No, uh, for art class in college, like you you had to take one art um, class, you know. So I'm all right. Intro to drawing, whatever it was that I picked, and um, uh, the top drawing on your uh, page there, and the one at the yeah. very top, yeah, that guy with the spiky like, hair, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's like pretty much the exact guy that we drew, you know, like the first day of class. So I had like deja vu, you know? Um, and to this day, it's like, you know, still one of the few things I could draw by hand and not have any sort of like instruction, you know? So yeah, I feel was, like the, the genius of that in that instruction was that uh, it's each body part you're making very small motions. So like the, the eyes were, a, it's like a 66 and the nose is like a half circle. The hair is a couple of spikes. The ear is a line, the two lines, like each, you just draw each part with a line versus when I would think to do it, like without that instruction, I'm probably creating like 20 or 30 lines for every single feature, which I think makes difference. Hey, honey. Hello. Um, let's see. Um, if you could teach something that you love that isn't necessarily anything to do with school, it's not like a school subject, but you would just love teaching it because you love the subject, what would it be? So this might be cheating a little bit because I've incorporated it into some of my um, history classes, um, yeah. but I'm a huge classic rock fan. I'm just obsessed. I love, you know, Beatles, Stones, Zeppelin, Grateful Dead, The Doors, all that stuff, you know, Dylan. Um, and uh, that's just stuff I look up and research, you know, on my free time. I just enjoy it. So I have, like, in, an obscene amount of useless knowledge when it comes to classic rock. Yeah. You know? uh, so it'd be cool to, like, teach a class on that. There's a... I'm pretty sure there are college courses that exist like that. I was, right? I was just going to say that. There's a college in Liverpool. It's called Liverpool Hope University. And uh, they have a master's program in uh, Beatles. You can major wow. in the Beatles, you know? So I toyed wow. around with that. You know, I actually gave that serious thought, you know, wow. this was like 10 years ago now. But like, nah, you, you can't market that anywhere. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't, I don't know where you would end up using that. I feel like if you learned a solid amount of like music theory for how to sound like the Beatles and then yeah. applying that to becoming like a, maybe like an agent for, for rock bands today or I don't know, understanding how they marketed themselves and how to create artists like that or how to take a band and bring them to the top like that maybe that would be applicable but yeah i mean it would be too academic for it to really apply to, to be fun to to like keep the fun part still intact yeah yeah, yeah. when we were studying um when i was teaching um the civil rights movement right um you know a bulk of that took place in the 60s and the music of the 60s reflected a lot of what was going on at yeah. the time so i brought in a lot of music from the 60s and i played a lot of like you know dylan and stuff um just to kind of give them a flavor of what was going on at the time you know but that's as close as i ever got to teaching classic rock you know? <laughs> now looking at that if you look at the 60s you can really see what was happening in history due to the music could you say the same about our current decade or our current era it's funny you should ask that i i was i was having a conversation with a friend of mine about 9 11 and how um Bruce Springsteen came out with his album, The Rising, um, kind of as a you know response to that. And he is the only artist or you know, band or, or just anything that I could think of that um, reflected what was going on at the time. And um, you know, I, I thought that was really weird because it was the exact opposite in the 60s. Everybody seemed to be, especially with the folk movement you know, of, of the early 60s, everybody seemed to be, you know, in a folk band and everybody had something to say and everyone wanted, you know, to get out there. And that just wasn't the case in in response to 9-11, at least not that I can think of. Can you th think of any bands or any songs or anything that came out? So sort of answering a slightly different question, I feel like, 
I feel like there haven't been specific historical things that have really happened that people have written music about, but I feel like the majority of, or, or a lot of what I hear is a mixture between people flexing their, their um, fortunes, mm -hmm. people hating on people flexing their fortunes, uh, partying, and, uh, and almost like an overall kind of depression. I feel like those are some of the main subjects that I feel like I hear music ending up being about. Um, I, I know there's a lot about like um, people feeling like we're, we're closer than ever with technology and at the same time not close at all. Like we have all these ways of communicating with each other in Facebook, but our real communications and our real interaction is, is getting worse. So I feel yeah. like I hear music about that, and I feel like that's about the closest I could say that we're we are to that kind of music from the '60s. No, I definitely agree with um, you know the closer we seem to be now, the farther apart we are. You know, um, I remember um, I actually have a friend who's um, still in the hotel game, and um, he says that you know when you're when you're hiring for the front desk and things like that you you hire young people like you know young college kids or whatever just looking to make a buck yeah and uh, the interview process he said he's noticed over the last you know um, 20 years just people are so much more timid in person than they <laughs> used to be you know and it's his his theory and i'm not sure i disagree is that everyone's used to just texting or emailing or doing everything virtually and when you right. actually have to go in in person you know and shake someone's hand and you know have a like professional jarring almost yeah. right it's like what no, I, i'm not you know used to this this is so weird you know so take that what you will um going off of uh going off of the classic rock what um now it's not necessarily when you it's not you're not that much older than me, I don't think. So you didn't I'm necessarily. Seven years old. How old are you, Zach? You're fifty-seven. <laughs> no, you're not. You're in your thirties. The fact that you like for a split second believe that I was fifty-seven years old, Zach. Good God. You're, oh, in, yeah. aren't, you're in your thirties, right? I am thirty-nine years old. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, Renato. It's fine. That's fine. We'll, That's why we're having this uh, interview because I just I don't know you that long. Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, but yeah. So, so you didn't grow up in the class in that classical rock era. What what brought you to it? What why did you gravitate to it? Well, it's funny you say I wasn't brought up. Like I, 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 you know, when the Beatles were releasing records, I didn't buy them as you know new releases. Right. That is true. But I did grow up with their music. My father would play. Oh. You know their albums all the time, you know, and um, I had a buddy who uh, played guitar and he introduced me to Bob Dylan and uh, my dad introduced me to like Johnny Cash and the Beach Boys and stuff like that. And from there, it just, you know, grew. It's actually weird. It's not until I got to school, like elementary school, that I realized um, that oldies, you know, weren't new music, you know, <laughs> I, I, it was, I, I actually remember the exact moment. It was, um, uh, I uh, went to school in Bill Ricca. It was the Parker School, and it was during recess. And I'm 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 young. I'm like third grade, I think. You know, yeah. and there was a kid um, who, at the time, you know, the cool thing was to have a boombox on your shoulder. Yeah, you know? and he was blasting uh, "Paradise City" by Guns N' Roses. Yeah. Okay. And I, I, guns and roses. I don't know that specific song off the top of my head. Oh man, it was it was I'm like I had never heard anything like that before. That was not something they played on the oldie station, you know. So and that's how I got introduced to like you know new music, if you will. Interesting. Yeah, yeah I I forget sometimes that people kind of grow up on the music that their parents introduced them to because my, my parents weren't super into music, so I didn't I mean, my mom used to listen to Beatles and like Josh Groban, but they were never really super into anything. Um, let's see, what was the other question I had lined up? Um, 
you ask me what transferred. So what's the, what's the next one? Like what what didn't transfer? Or what was I surprised? Yeah. Oh, um, what did you have to unlearn to become a teacher? Oh, um, leaving people alone, expectations, right? Mm -hmm. um, in the corporate world, I, I worked with with just adults, just like people who were in the twentieth year of their you know career, and I would just you know we'd all get into a meeting and uh, we would talk about the marketing campaign, and then we would all have our action items and what we needed to do, and we would leave. And the next week, uh, we would you know, meet up again and everyone would just show what they had. And you can't really do that um, when you're teaching, you know, people are, are at, you know, different levels, you know, now some people get done super quick, others take a little bit longer. Um, so you can't just treat everyone as if everyone's on the same page all the time, you right. know? Uh, so you have to just kind of, which is fine. It, 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 you know, makes my day interesting every day, you know? Uh, but you, you have to kind of, you know, take the pulse of everyone and see where they're at and what they need and things like that. So. Um, Dylan is asking right now, he said, I want to do an interview with you all. And I said, what would you ask? And he said, I'd figure out something as I watch and listen. So I'm trying to get him to like. Oh, Dylan. Um. What I, oh, so I, I feel like you'll have a great answer to this when I was thinking of you when I wrote this. What idea slash concept is so misunderstood or like not common knowledge that it gets you mad when people or adults still don't know about it? Geography. Easy. <laughs> Super easy. People have no idea where they are in the world. And it just really upsets me. So yeah. like, like what's a question that, I hope to dear God that I'm smart enough to answer this, but like right. you want to I'll, test I'll, me, see if I'm one of the people that piss you off. I will, I will put you on the spot. Uh, it, it's not like, I don't expect you to know where like, you know, Pago Pago is, you know, um, that's in the American Samoa. The American no, Samoa is in that one. South Pacific and it's American territory, but that's fine. But people like even in their own backyard, they have no idea. Ready? Zach, what's the capital of Vermont? Burlington? No. No. Burlington's a major city, but it's not Burlington. It is. I mean, we say city. The population of Burlington is less than Billerica. Yeah. Oh. So, but I mean, that's just because it's Vermont and there's just nobody up there. I love Vermont, by the way. I love the fact that it's so rural. You know? What is it? It's Montpelier or Montpelier, if you want to get fancy. Montpelier, Vermont. Yeah, it's been a while. All right, give me another one. Wait, so like, wow. is it is it is state capitals? Is that one of the ones that you really wish it's people knew? General geography, like people, you know, like they have. Like I'm, I'm Portuguese. If 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 you had to, could you find Portugal on a map? Um, I'm pretty sure I would go over to Europe, and I know it's so Spain is like a. Spain is like um, a block of a thing. Portugal, I'm pretty sure, is a bit squiggly. Yeah. That's, I, I well, think that's it's, the best it's, I can do without a map in front of me. It's it's like a um, you know it's it's like a rectangle, yeah, you know, that borders okay. Spain. Uh, it's right on the Atlantic Ocean, and it's the first thing you hit in Europe. So if you go to Boston and you know head towards Europe, the first landfall you, you'll hit is is Port Portugal. That's it. Like we fought wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and Vietnam, you know, and, and people just can't even find those places on a map, you know. And there's like people who died for your freedom to own a map, <laughs> you know. What I mean? Yeah, you just, you know, stuff like that. So just not. It's it's not so much like you know you know stupid little piddly dink trivia things. It's just the the big ticket items, you know. Like you you should know where Iraq is. You should know where Afghanistan is. You should know yeah. where Paris is. Where London is Rome. You should be able to find these things on a map. Now, you when know? you say find these things on a map, like hand you a map and be able to find it in about five seconds. Yeah, it it, it should be common knowledge. Like you shouldn't have to struggle. You shouldn't have to be like, oh, I think it's it's over here somewhere. No, no. Like, these are the, the you should you know. be able to know pretty much their con you should know their continent and uh, generally 
where in the continent, like the south side, the east side, the north side? Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just basic, basic geography. I feel like there is a secondary answer to that question from you. I, I might I might be wrong. I feel like there might be another thing that you wish people were not messing up that that um, gets you. I mean, I, I could pick another thing like politics, you know, and not so much politics, but elections and how our election system works and, you know, what's involved with that. Like we don't, everyone says that America is this great um, democracy. We're actually a democratic oh. republic. Oh, that's I, I don't think I was going to get that wording right, but I knew uh, that I, I knew that it wasn't because if it were a democracy, then the popular vote would actually cause the president, which it doesn't. Right. It's it's it would never work with a country our size. It, it, it wouldn't work with more than 100 people. You know, it's a true democracy. There's no middleman between uh, you and the decision. Right. So if, you know, you wanted, um, you know, to have a traffic light installed in the center of town, right, there, there would be a simple vote, you know, and if, you know, 50 percent plus one voted yes, then that's it, you know, but we don't do that. What we do is because we're a democratic republic, we elect the people who make the decisions. That's what, you know, um, senators are and um, representatives, governors, things like that, you know, because it, it's just, it's too big. It's too big for the people themselves to make every single choice. Well, that's why we elect people to make them for us. Now, do you, do you think it's still good that we have a democratic republic when it comes to voting for the president, like popular vote versus having the delegates? I think it's, it's, there are pros and cons to both sides. Uh, I I would say it's you know um, I would switch over and just have the popular vote be be the decider. The, the the problem with that, the whole reason that the electoral college got started is you didn't want lesser states um, to get forgotten, right? So if it was all about the popular vote, people would just campaign in New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago, and that's it. Uh, you know? And now with this, they're going to New Hampshire, they're going to Iowa, you know, to try to build momentum. Joe Biden is about to win the Democratic nomination because he turned everything around in um, South Carolina. You yeah. Know? Uh, that wouldn't have happened if it was just based solely on the popular vote. Interesting. Yeah, because yeah, that's right. You would, you would just post up in New York City and Los Angeles and whatever and try so to do some that's of it. The top populated places because the actual vote is like it ends up being like what 50 million votes to 50 ish million votes yeah give or take yeah so you'd if you went to the top top 50 cities that would probably be a a more efficient way of campaigning if it were just a popular vote i would i would imagine well, the, the way they do it now is they go to the biggest cities with the states that have the most people. Yeah. Right. So, or the most swing value. So, I right. New Hampshire were the, the first ones. Exactly. Where you, you might just, you know, forget, um, I don't know, Missouri or something, you know, because, uh, well, you know, they have St. Louis. Let's pick another one. Um, like uh, New Mexico is a swing state, right? Santa Fe and, Albuquerque aren't like huge metropolises, you know, um, so you would just ignore it, you know, um, but now because it's a swing state and you want their electoral college votes, you'll, you might make a stop or two, you know? Yeah. Um, so, um, but another question. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say in the end, it's a wash. Um, it, this has only been an issue uh, the past 20 years. We've had, two presidents um, who are in office but did not win the popular vote. You know, more people voted for the other candidate than voted for the guy who eventually won. That's you Bush know? and Trump, right? Right, right. Bush W, George W. Bush, not right. his father. His right. father won both, you know. So. Um, I, have a, I have a question that I'm pretty sure you can answer because you seem to know politics and government pretty well. 
Put me um, on the spot. Here we go. So I've been watching the news. Um, one of the main criticisms to the federal government and Trump seems to be um, that he is not um, – it's a – you're probably going to be able to finish my sentence, but it's the – it, some act that was created, I think, for World War II that forces companies to create items when there's yeah. like a national emergency. And he has the power to say, all right, put my foot down. All these companies need to make ventilators for our system. Um, yeah. I think it's called the Defense Protection Act. Or something. That sounds right. Yeah. Could you give us, so I think, so for the students or the people watching that probably don't have a good idea of that, could you tell us at all about what maybe the the pros and cons are of that? Because I think Trump has talked about he doesn't want to turn our country into a, a nationalist state or something like that. Yeah, um, a communist state, I think, uh, because he, he is a self-identified nationalist. And for those of you who don't know, Nationalist is somebody who puts uh, their country ahead of anything else, and they just identify, you know, they're isolationists, essentially. You know, like, our country can do anything, and our country can take care of our, our own, and, and that's it. But you exclude a lot of other people in other countries and things like that uh, if, you, if you do that. Um, but the, the, the main downside to doing that, to, um, to enacting or, you know, calling into action the... Defense Protection Act, whatever it's called, is you're you're just unilaterally telling people what to do. You're the it's it's every conservative's nightmare, you know, especially every libertarian's nightmare that the government tells you you have to do something, and uh, now you have to, otherwise you have to suffer the uh, consequences. We are a capitalist nation; we do everything for money. That's the driving force behind everything, you know. Um, and it's, it's worked, you know, um, for our entire history, you know, um, I think it was Churchill. I, I'm not, not sure if he said, if this was about democracy or capitalism, but he said, um, capitalism is, uh, the worst, uh, form of government, um, except for every other one. Right. So it's, it's basically just like the best we have. Um, but that's the biggest issue. Like you, you just don't want to you know, tell people what to do, like do it because that's what they do in China and, you know, Cuba and Russia, you know, and we don't want to be those, those aren't good examples. Those aren't examples we want to follow. Um, that being said, you know, these are desperate times and we're, we, we as a nation and as a world, we're just looking for leadership and everybody just wants this to go away. Yeah, you know, everybody just wants this to go away and we want to just get back to normal and, you know, whatever you have to do to make that happen, you know, do it. So, um, personally, I think it's okay to do that um, in times where it serves, um, where the public need and the public health um, needs to be served above any sense of, you know, um, hurt feelings, you know, um, or feelings of, of, of impediment by the government into your own personal liberties. If, if it's for the safety, health, and well-being of the entire nation, then, you know, take one for the team and just do it. Yeah. Um, another question. So I, I feel like, uh, the, I feel like every night I, I go onto the news or, and I'll see a live stream of the president addressing how, however things are, now and it usually to me feels like did, didn't we have this conversation yesterday like it all seems kind of the same to me um mm -hmm. so i feel like that right there the the act that you just talked about is one of the things that that is that could be a progression of change in leadership and i'm thinking would you say that the other change that people might be looking for is they want donald to to tell the governors or like, it seems like he really wants to have the governors really own the, however they run their states and he doesn't want to tell them how to run their states. And it sounds like at the same time, because I think they were, they're saying that the, the curve has not been going down much and that people are really not being responsible. And I think it, 
it sounds like some people are wanting him to say, governors, tell your people to stay home. Like, like be be strong in that order and don't be wishy-washy about it. Would, would you agree with that? Yeah. Um, what I compare it to is this. Um, Trump has himself um, said that he is a wartime president, you mm -hmm. know, uh, because the country's at war, except instead of an army, we're at war against the virus, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, let's just assume for the sake of this talk that um, we were being invaded by an army, right? Um, which would you prefer, right? Uh, to have the United States Army, you know, go and, 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 and protect the individual states, or would you want the National Guard of each individual state to be responsible for that state's security and health, right? So like, you know, going back to history, Japan attacked um, Hawaii, Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941, right? And that's how we entered World War II, right? Um, imagine they kept going. Imagine if Japan didn't stop there, they also attacked um, the West Coast. And now California, Oregon, and Washington State are all um, under attack, right? Yeah. Would, would you be all right with the National Guards of those individual states just trying to protect themselves? Or should the president at the time, FDR, um, have sent in, you know, the federal troops and just all hands on deck and everybody just defend our borders, right? So that's where people are coming from, I think. Um, and just to kind of answer my own question, I mean, the, obviously it's better to have a federal right. response to this, right? Um, yeah, you sold me on that one. I, I, had not, I had not thought of that as being like a, a comparison. I'm not even sure I really understood what the National Guard was until you just explained that. Yeah, no. Um, if a governor declares, so each state has its own National Guard. It's, it's, it's their own, you know, um, troops, if you will, right? Um, most of the time they just, um, you know, they, I mean, they, they can be federalized, and I guess that's my large point, but um, if the um, governor declares a state of emergency, the, just like the president is the commander-in-chief of the U.S. armed forces, the governor of an individual state is also the commander-in-chief of that um, state's National Guard units, right? Um, until the president, you know, who is his, his only boss, right, uh, decides to federalize the troops, right? then he could overrule any governor's um, um, orders, right? So, like, for example, Governor Baker, he hasn't um, used the National Guard yet, at least not that I've heard of, mm -hmm. you know, but he could, you know, that's a huge, huge step to take because now all of a sudden there's troops in the street and that's going to freak everyone out and yeah. all that stuff, you know? Um, so Trump is letting each individual governor kind of use, you know, their own forces and powers and, and, and just, you know, you're, you're getting a lot of supplemental help. Like, you know, they're sending face masks and things like that and opening up funds and money and stuff. But, you know, each state is kind of on its own, you know, and, uh, you know, we look at China where this whole thing started. And, um, you know, they had a massive outbreak, but, um, and again, I don't want to like extol, you know, praise on a communist nation, but they don't yeah. have to deal with any sort of, you know, um, constitution or, you know, impinging on like anyone's rights, you know, right. whatever the government wants, that's what they're going to do. Yeah. Right. So they shut everything down. They shut everything down. Everyone stay home. You know, there's troops in the streets. They shut everything down. Right. Um, and, um, there weren't any real consequences to that. Well, you know, the larger conversation here is, um, what, what does that mean for each individual person's, um, freedoms and rights in China, but in the short term doing that, just acting unilaterally like that, they were able to turn this thing around real quick. Yeah. Uh, and as a result, the U S just passed China. Uh, with number of um, Total uh, cases, right? Um, and just to put that into perspective, the United States has 330 million people. China has a billion. 
we literally have a third the population of China, and we now have more cases than they do. And I think a larger reason for that is uh, because we're leaving each individual state, you yeah. know, to kind of take care of you know themselves. Yeah, it's an interesting thing pointing out that he had said that I'm a I'm a wartime president, mm -hmm. and you're also kind of pointing out he's not he's not enacting his power as he could if we were dealing with a a real war with another country. Right. I. Uh, I, I don't want to be too um, I don't want to be too political on here, um, but I, I do feel like a lot of times Trump is saying things, and then so, like I feel like almost in an impressive way, completely contradicts himself very quickly. Like uh, like him saying, um, you know, I, I think this is going to blow over. Uh, it was either like mid February or March, and then. He was saying this past week and the week before, like, you know, I knew this was super serious from the beginning. And I've been dealing, I was one of the first person, people dealing with this very seriously at the beginning. And I feel like he contradicts himself in that way. And I feel like I have less trust in listening to what he has to say than, than Charlie Baker, my governor. Mm. And I feel like that's um, sort of like, like in another enemy in there. Like there was a post 9-11 and pre-9-11 world. And I feel like we're now going to experience this like, I don't know if it's going to be a pre-post Trump world or a pre-post COVID world. And I, I'm, what, what, what do you think a post COVID world might look like in terms of what kind of concepts or cultures change? I think people have short memories when it comes to stuff like this um that's that's almost weird to say because we've never had something like this before um yeah. but i think you know everyone's under orders to stay at home and everyone's doing that and we're all doing our best but this thing in my opinion and again i'm no you know medical expert but this isn't really going to go away until we have either a vaccine or a cure or a treatment or something right yeah. Once that happens, once they roll that out, you know, people are going to go back to, uh, you know, just the way things were before. You yeah. Know? Um, I think it'll be a slow rollout. You know, people will, you know, be still a little bit, you know, like I know if I watch a movie now and I see people like, you know, sitting down, at, you know, in public, you know, just eating dinner or whatever, you know, I like it's it's weird to even see that. <laughs> you know, like there's no social distancing going on you know yeah. um but slowly that stuff will all fade away you know this is part of the frustration of being such a like history nerd right i, I just i have so much knowledge about all the crap that we've all gone through as a people and um i've, I've just found um that you know people are working with blank slates when it comes to history you know um and it's really unfortunate because it just repeats itself over and over and over again. We're just doing the same things over and over and over again, you know? Yeah. Um, so, like, people don't even know when um, Pearl Harbor happened, you know? And to me, that's like, you know, someone saying that they don't remember um, when 9-11 happened. Now, that's a little different because the date is actually in the title, you know? Yeah. And that's not the case with... Uh, Pearl Harbor, but you know, it's just stuff like we just forget things. That's what happens. We forget and we go back in. We we were in a war in the Middle East in the early nineties, right? And it was just one generation later, you know. Um, and and we went back again, the same places, you know. And we had the same outcome as we did the previous time. But we always think, you know, I guess that's part of the. Um, thing of being, you know, an optimistic nation. We always just think that things are going to work out and things are going to, you know, work out for the better, you know? Um, what, what would you say was the result of that? Because I'm honestly pretty unclear about what the results of those wars were. We went into Iraq because we were sold a bill of goods. We were told that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. They did not. Um, and that's it. That's it for that. So the outcome of that was we removed Saddam Hussein from power. 
Yeah. And now they have democratic elections and um, they have a prime minister. And I don't remember what his name was at the moment, but, um, you know, I, I guess a positive outcome of that would be that they're now a democratic nation, but, um, you know, how true and, and honest are those elections and they still have to deal with um, attacks and bombings and things like that from their own people. And it's just, you know, you're, you're trying to force democracy down people's throats, you know? Yeah. So. If, if you're looking for a silver lining, um, Afghanistan, I guess, you know, um, they were the one, like all the um, terrorists that attacked us, like most of them were from there. Yeah. You know, but I mean, that's just a country of just rocks and, and caves and stuff. You know, they have a couple of cities um, and the people themselves are like just super duper nice. Every like documentary I've ever seen was just about how warm the people you know, welcomed uh, the soldiers, um, except for the terrorists, of course. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, but we um, did away with their leadership, and now we have um, a democratic um, infrastructure for them. And that seems to be going well. They seem to be voting, and they just um, voted out one guy, and they got another guy in there now. And that seems to be going okay. Um, you know, before all this, we were all talking about um, ISIS, you know, yeah. yeah. No. You know, that's actually a good question. Like, does the stay-at-home order apply to ISIS? Yeah. <laughs> like, are, are I've, been still... I've been really curious. Like, I wonder how the crime rates have been. Like, have have criminals been staying home, doing less bad things? I, I haven't heard much of anything. I mean, I, I've been you know super busy, but I haven't heard of any spiking crime. I heard of like these three guys at a mall. I think it was like on the North Shore that they broke into the mall. And went to like a champ sports or something and just like stole a bunch of stuff but they were caught by the cops because you know their security systems were still in place you right. know so that's the only like crime I they're, they're probably the only ones on the street yeah you know it's pretty easy to uh to find um yeah i was i was looking it up the other day i was like i was trying to find out what are the most common crimes in america and theft is i think the number one so like petty theft and then it then it's like three other kinds of theft before it becomes like violent violent things yeah. so i was thinking i feel like that uh theft could uh, i could imagine going up especially if we start um i feel like at the beginning it felt like a bit of hysteria and i feel like uh it's been a it's been calming more and people have been just I'm wondering if at some point it will it could become hysteria again if a lot more people end up dying and or um, you know if hospitals start getting overloaded like someone was telling me that um, they were preparing an ice rink in Massachusetts to become like a, a backup morgue or something um, which sounded way more alarming than any of the numbers I feel like I've seen. I mean, in his press conference, Trump um, had a team of specialists who just kind of, you know, laid out what they think is going to happen. And they had a best case and a worst case. Yeah. And um, best case would be, you know, uh, 240,000, you know, deaths. Yeah. Yeah, worst case would be um, 2.2 million deaths. But um, 2.2 million is without any sort of action on our part. You know, that's yeah. what happened during the Spanish flu of 1918. Right, the president at the time, Woodrow Wilson, didn't do anything. Didn't do anything. Didn't do a single thing. No, it was up to the individual cities. Um, you know, to take care of like, and people had no sense of like social distancing or anything like that. Those terms, that term was invented during that um, um, outbreak, during that pandemic, you know, uh, the, it was a Spanish flu pandemic of 1918. And, they, people, and they didn't yeah. really understand how these these viruses spread then either, right? Uh, no, I mean, they, they, they did. They instituted like a whole bunch of like mask wearing stuff and everyone wore masks and things like that. Um, but, you know, 
it, the social distancing and the self quarantining is way more effective than a mask, um, right. big picture wise. Yeah. You know? Um, and they didn't really do that. They had, this was at the end of, um, world war one. And, um, I forget, I think it was St. Louis. It was St. Louis and Philadelphia. These are the two prime, prime examples, right? They both decided, uh, they both had plans for a victory, um, parade. Right. Yeah. Um, one of the cities uh, decided to cancel it, um, and the other one decided to hold it. You know, no, it's fine. Let's do this. This is great. Let's have a party. <laughs> and as a result, I think it was Philadelphia. They decided to have it. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, they they were the hardest hit city um, of the entire country, and St. Louis that canceled it was the lowest or among the lowest. Yeah. You know? Now some people really started saying, okay, this whole, you know, distancing, quarantining. I didn't hear a lot of uh, quarantining, you know, but that's where all these rules came from. It's just how people reacted to uh, the Spanish flu of 1918, you know, everything that we're doing now. Hmm. So, uh, but that petered out because the virus, it took like a year and a half with very few um, restrictions, you know. Um, and it just kind of people who got it, you know, they either made it or they didn't. And um, if they did, they would develop an immunity. So after a year and a half, it just kind of went away. It ran out of hosts. You yeah. know, uh, that's not what's going to happen here. Everyone is everyone in the world is staying home. You know, so I think we're much closer to the you know best case of 240,000 than we are to the worst case. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's um, it's still uh, the other day. Uh, I was hearing my wife. Um, uh, my wife still has to go to work, so she's a vet tech, and okay. um, she she hears stories all the time about because she's communicating with a lot more people than I am, and every once in a while she would hear about people like still having parties, and yeah, no, that, that's that blows my mind that people aren't. Uh, aren't taking that advice as literally as, as we are. Uh, yeah, me too. Have, um, have any of the, the effects of COVID been, you know, close to home for you at all? My, I know my aunt has been, uh, I, I forget if she had said she'd been tested, but she's been, um, she has it. She's been staying home. I, I do know one person, not my family, but, uh, family friend, um, much older died. And I think I know two or three other people that have it. Yeah. No, I have a friend whose uh, father died. Um, he was 67, you know, uh, which is still on the young side, you know, but that was tough. And I have another friend whose father currently has it. Um, and he's intubated, but he seems to be doing okay. And is slowly, getting better but um you know he worked in the hotel biz so he was just around people all the time you know yeah. and he got it two weeks ago whatever it was and it just got worse um but now hopefully he's turning the corner you know but um yeah and hopefully that'll be as as close as it ever gets you know to yeah. home you know a um, total side note i wanted yeah. to ask uh Am I right in thinking you had a knee injury back in the end of uh, summer or midsummer? Yeah, no, it was actually, I was getting out of the, the van. I just twisted it and it popped. That was, was it. Is that, was that your knee? Yeah. Uh, left knee. Torn ACL? No, it was just a hyperextension, but uh, I mean, not to get gross, but like the kneecap yeah. uh, stayed and the rest of my leg turned left. <laughs> Damn. So, so it just didn't turn, you know, and um, it swelled up and it was just awful. It took a long time to come back from something like that, you know. It was just annoying uh, because I couldn't walk. For the, for the first week, I couldn't walk. I couldn't do any. I was, like, mobile. Yeah. You know? I had to get a wheelchair and the whole bit. Oh, God, it was awful, awful. So, but now, you know, now it's fine. I just, um, if I walk really long distances, you know, like, a little bit, yeah. But it, like, it's fine. I can still walk on it. But like, you know, I, I could definitely feel it in my left knee versus my right. You yeah. Know? 
Um, I'm asking because I'm I'm curious if you have any advice for me as I have a torn ACL. And, sure, yeah. Uh, and last Wednesday, so the, and also a p part of my femur chipped off. So last Wednesday, they took um, they called it a dart, not quite a screw, but they had the little chipped piece, and then they put the screw thing in so that it stays in there. Mm -hmm. um, so right now I'm resting on that, so I can't bend my leg for this past week and probably a week or two more, and then then I can start to bend it. Once I start bending it a bit, then I'll have ACL surgery, and then I'll have like a second kind of. Uh, second round of healing that sounds like crazy fun <laughs> I, I the only thing i can really say is that the uh the covid uh school cancel uh, school closure um has been perfect timing for me yeah yeah, yeah. it could yeah. it could have only been more perfect if it had happened a week later uh but so i i had to spend about five seven i think seven sick days and then there was school closure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. so, I mean, in terms of advice, there's not much I can give you that would be different from literally anybody else right now. You know, <laughs> it was just like, you know, rest it and um, just try to keep your mind active. You know, otherwise you'll go stir crazy. Did uh, now, did you have to take? Um, so, I have to, I'm taking a pain medication, which I was, ex I was really concerned about at first because it's uh, Percocet mm -hmm. and I've been, uh, very aware of my of opioids especially um with our student populations and the addiction of it and everything so i've been really i was really scared about taking them at first they said look you you got a little piece of thing in your bone right now that's going to hurt a lot you're going to want some pain meds so i've trusted that and i've been trying to wean myself off of it as much as i can as fast as i can um, did you have to take pain meds or anything Nothing strong. I, you know, I, I think you're, you're fine as long as you're just following doctor's orders. But uh, for me, it was just um, uh, ibuprofen, Advil, you know, just constantly every every four to six hours taking it. But after after the first week, week and a half, you know, it was it was fine. Like I, I didn't need it, you know. It's kind of like you know, tough it out. And then after the first, I don't know, two or three weeks, then it was just annoying. Yeah, you know, I just wanted to get out and leave and kind of like now. Yeah. Um, Dylan is asking in the comments. I, I don't know if I'm assuming he's kind of asking it to me, but I'm gonna ask you too. Do you have any pets? I don't. I would love to have a dog. But, I was gonna uh, I, I was gonna guess that you you might have had a cat. I feel like you could no, be a cat guy. I am deathly allergic to cats. Ah I can't. If I'm in the same room as a cat and I don't see him or her, I you, you don't have to tell me. I my body will tell me that there's a cat in the room inside of ten minutes. You, know? Do you start sneezing. Is that the main? My, my face explodes. It just turns into this huge thing. And like, really? <laughs> it's just awful. Awful. Yeah. Now, yeah. if I have like cat hair on my shirt and I get near you, will that impact you? I mean, as long as we, we don't hug it out, Zach. I, th I think I think I'll be all right. Yeah. <laughs> Good to know. Yeah. Um, and Dylan, to answer your question for me, I have a dog and two cats. Aspen, who's a great Pyrenees, just over a year old. Samson is a tuxedo cat, uh, six years old now. And George is a all-black cat who is two and a half years old. Um, so you can do the math for figuring out how old they are. If dogs are the have the human equivalent one dog year is the equivalent to us aging like seven years you can do the math on that i don't do you know what the cat conversion is for human years i do not <laughs> i imagine it's around the same because they both have the same life expectancy right i've never heard of like a 50 year old cat you know <laughs> that'd be crazy yeah. well um renato i don't have any other questions i've written down i have really enjoyed hearing your thoughts on government and i feel like i've learned a lot uh just in general about politics i'm glad that i had you on especially for that is there, cool. is there anything you. that you've enjoyed talking about that you'd want to uh maybe add add some other things in about what do you mean to my, my classes in terms of what we discussed or 
uh, in terms of what we discussed, any just any general messages you'd like to share with the audience? We currently have three people watching right now. I don't know how many people are going to make it to an hour into this that aren't watching currently. Yeah. Um, all, all I would say is, you know, being a history teacher, you 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 study a lot about what America has gone through, and this seems to be really tough times. We've gone through tough times before, and we've not only come through them, but we've come through them stronger. So it, it's tough now. Just keep going. All we're, we're being asked to do is just to stay home. So just stay home. Stay home. We'll get through this. And when we do, it's going to be like the biggest party any of us ever have ever had. So <laughs> now it's, it's, it's anxious times out there, but it, it will get better. I promise you. Yeah, there's going to be graduation party season wedding season and uh social undistancing season right. <laughs> yeah um well renato thank you so much uh thank you for being the first teacher from uh from our group of colleagues to join me uh, yeah. i hope that some of them are inspired to join me I've, I've asked a couple uh that i'm better friends with than others um what uh would you say you had enough fun that you would recommend it to other teachers to to come on here? Even if I didn't, I would still like to watch them squirm. So yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Invite everybody, every single person that you can. Um, all right. Who, uh, who, if you were to uh, recommend the next person to have on here, who would you have me go after? Without a doubt, it would have to be Jake, just so you can see um, and everybody else can see his new mustache that, that he's growing during the quarantine. I was going to say, I think, uh, I feel like Nick LeClaire would be a really entertaining guest on here. He would as well. Uh, everybody would. I'd love to see what everybody has to say. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, if you come up with any other questions to add to the, that list for those people, I would love to have them. Will do. All right. Well, Renato, thank you again. Uh, thank you for your time. You've given us a whole hour. Thank you to the audience for being respectful. Uh, I have not encountered any trolls today despite yesterday i did a, a i did a silent meditation for like 12 minutes and like a raid of people which i was thankful to get the watch time but like they're saying some horrible things that was just really inappropriate and i was sad for anyone that was watching that while i had my eyes closed and was telling everybody how to meditate like just nonsense was happening in there no that's not good yeah um Renato, thank you. Um, for everyone else, as you, if uh, if you like this, give it a like. If you didn't like this, give it a dislike and let me know uh, what I should change or improve about this show. I guess you'd call it. Um, if you want to receive notifications for future episodes, click the subscribe button and the bell will give you notifications. And uh, as always, stay weird, humans. Bye, everybody. Bye, Renato. Thank you.